Hello, and welcome to Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract. And in this Zim Explore, we're going to take a look at the game of life. So this is here on CodePen. You can find it on CodePen under Isometric Game of Life on the Zim CodePen. So here's what it looks like. You hit play, and these elements, the, the people or the trees, will either live or die. Uh, or be created, depending on some simple rules, and these patterns start emerging, and they can go on forever, or, well, I don't know if it actually goes on forever, but a long time, or it can just die out, or it can sort of die out to these repeating patterns. Um, all right, well, the rules are roughly for a person on a square, if they're alive, we'll just call it person, person or tree is what we're talking about. For a person on a square, if there's less than two people around that person, then, oh, it dies. If there's more than three people around the person, oh, it dies. But if there's two or three people around the person, then it survives. If it's an empty square and there's exactly three people around it, then a person grows, it gets created. So those are the rules. It's basically, I guess, three rules there. And from that, all these interesting things happen. Like, look, it's almost going to die out here. Who knows? Oh, now there goes that one. Will it die out or will it live? Oh. <laughs> you know, it's kind of neat. And sometimes you get these, uh, these cool repeating patterns. So these are how many generations it's done. So each step of the way. And what we've done in Zim is we've added some interfaces to allow us to pause the replay and make a new one and you'll see oh it's still going huh look at that come back oh okay now it's reducing a fair bit here there we go and it's gone 93 generations so when we hit uh, make a new one you'll see that we're able to adjust the speed that these ones go so if we make a nice simple one let's just do that Oop. There we go. Okay, note how we're making the, the, the things. We can also like drag as we go. Or click and then we hit play. <laughs> well, that wasn't very exciting. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's, let's try that again. Well, I'll just put a, a few wiggles on and play. I want to like die out immediately. So here goes this one and look at those neat patterns that it starts making. And cool. Um, and we can adjust the speed as mentioned, and we can also um, hit the, the whether we want trees or not. This is what it looks like with trees. Let's try a new one. Some interesting ones. Watch, watch this one. And I think it was like here. Maybe it was one more over. Oh, I missed. Oopsie daisy. And we hit play. Ooh. 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 Ah. Ooh, uh, like a strange S, huh? Foop, foop. Oh, that's the only thing. All of a sudden, wah, 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 wah. interesting. So these are ones that just end up staying if you have a little square. And we didn't do a test to find out if they stay. Speaking of tests, why don't we then uh, go in and take a look at um, how how we built this thing? So this is the top interface here with with a couple what they are, are scores they come with zim uh, and this is in the game module the game module has an isometric board like this it's also got scores and you can turn if you say the score is going to be on the left it assumes you mean isometric or on the right it means isometric and you can slant these things like that and we've got some navigation along the bottom that we're going to throw into a tile and that will handle the positioning of and the spacing of all of our bottom navigation there. We apply some styles to style these two buttons and to style the radio buttons. And uh, yeah, let's let's go in and take a look. Um, instead of looking at the code here in CodePen, although you're welcome to do that, we're going to drop out and take a look at it in uh, in Atom. So here it is, the same, same code in Atom. We can control it a little bit better here. We're bringing in CreateJS, which is what Zim is powered by and based on. And then uh, Zim adds a bunch of conveniences, components, and controls onto the top of that. We're also bringing in from the same place here, the game module uh, 2.2 we're on, which provides us with the board. 
Here's our basic template kind of stuff. We have just recently added the ability to lighten and darken colors. So that's a Zim blue color. Works on any color string as well. You could put quote blue there and that would be the HTML blue. See this, okay, let's bring that up a bit. And then we can lighten it by a certain amount. That's giving us the background color on the, on the frame there. Uh, most of the rest of this stuff is just template right here. And then we come in to create the board. So you would need the game, the game module to make a new board. And by default, that's isometric, although you can also turn isometric off and it would be a flat board. We're saying making make it 28 pixels. That's how big the square is. And then by 14, that's just kind of like random fitting. So it roughly fits on the screen there. I kind of like the way that it goes slightly off the edge and sort of anchors this rather than putting the tip there. But we could have, of course, arranged that so that it fit on there perfectly if we so desired. So that's a board. And the board provides a bunch of methods and properties that we can use to help us as we build this system. You're going to see those. Here's us adding a mouse down event on the board. And what we're doing is we're capturing that we can click here and build a person. But not only that, that's how we started. So we'd have to click to build. And then in the end, it was easier to press and drag. So I'm still pressing and I'm dragging along. We can actually drag back and delete ones and drag forward and add them and stuff. And that was much easier. So let's take a look at the events that will allow us to create those people on the board. The first starting point is a mouse down. This was added after. We don't want to create people as the simulation is running. So there are two times when we are okay to, uh, or not okay. So we don't want it when the play button doesn't say play. So note that uh, at the moment the play button says play, but if we hit play, it says replay. We don't want to be able to add people here, and indeed we can't. So I didn't need to hit new, but it doesn't matter. The other time is if we if it's not paused, then we also run. Uh, the, if we if it says replay and it's actually paused, we do allow people to add things while it's paused. So that allows you to partway through a simulation make changes if you so desire. All right. So here's what we're doing. Every time we mouse down, we're making a person and we're passing it the column and the row. So the board works with columns and rows. Uh, we also receive at any time uh, that this is highlighted. So note, you see as I highlight that, that is a change event that will tell us a current tile. And indeed, when we press down, you see how that's highlighted still. That means the current tile is whatever we pressed on. So we're using the current tile here, the board.current tile, to find what we were pressed on. Now we could make a person right on that current tile, and that's how we started off. But later, when we wanted to replay, we need to create people, but those people are not necessarily on the current tile. Most of them won't be. So we had to adjust our our function here, it's called factoring or refactoring, we had to adjust our function to accept a column and a row. So based on the current tile when we press down, we're going to ask for the board call and the board row. Now that looks a little bit awkward. Why isn't it just current tile dot call? Well, it turns out that the board can accept information or uh, information that is bigger than the board so that there can be many columns and rows out there, but the board is only showing a certain, uh, certain bits of that information. So we've clarified this by saying, this is the current tiles board column. It's not the actual column uh, data in the, that's, that's I and J is column data in the overall information. And that allows us to store uh, larger information. For instance, we made an isometric maze and the data for that or the information is bigger than the board. There's many other squares and the board only shows certain ones and then can move across that information to show, you know, different parts of the world in a sense. So board call just means the column specifically showing on the board. All right. So uh, we'll see the make person in just a, just a sec, but let's uh, continue on with the events here. 
when we change, the, when the board changes, that means the highlight has changed. We're going to call this function. We just have to watch out because, uh, so you see this, that there it is. And if I move here, that's a change. If I move here, that's a change. But watch this. If I move off the board, boom, that's also a change because that highlight's gone. However, at this point, we have no current tile selected. So we have to say, if there's not a current tile, then we return. Otherwise, it tries to make a person that isn't on the board, and we don't want that. So here's uh, us making people as we change uh, events as well, or in the change event, and we do the same thing, basically. We're saying the current tile pass it the, the column and the row there. Now, this drag event is on change, but we don't want it to be firing if we haven't pressed down. So here we're inside of the mouse down here. So we start the change event, but when we mouse up or when we press up, we want to take off the change event. We no longer want that event running anymore. So to be able to handle that, we assign the event. So here's the on method, we assign the results of that to a drag event ID in a sense, or a reference, and that allows us to say board.off. So the way you remove an event, this one says board.on change, this one says board.off change, and you pass it the reference to the function, that's, there will really be sort of this reference right here, that allows us specifically to turn off uh, this event that we added. And that allows us to make multiple events and turn some of them off when we want and not turn other ones off. So that's how it's done. Now the other thing about this press up event, aside from turning the off, we don't want this to happen every time we press up. Because what would happen is if we uh, mouse down and we make this drag event, uh, it would also make the press up event. Every time we mouse down, we're making a press up event. If we if we just kept on doing this, we would have dozens, if not hundreds, of press up events being made each time. So what we want is when we press up, we want this event to go away. So we have a nice easy way to do this. CreateJS has provided us a nice easy way. In the on, the fourth parameter here, if we set that to true, it means it will run this event only once. Neat, huh? So here's the first parameter, is what type of event, the function. This one's about bubbling, and this one is, do you want this to run only once? So that's a nice easy way. Another way we could do that is collect the event object, and then say e.remove right here. So what this would do, and we wouldn't need this right here, Oop, well, the bracket, is that it would collect the event object, and once we uh, run it once, it would then remove its own, the event. And that would allow us to remove the event if a certain thing is happening. Say, after a certain amount of time, remove the event, but otherwise don't remove the event, you know? So that gives us more flexibility, but it's uh, sort of a two-step process there. Either one would work fine. However, we've decided to uh, just set that fourth parameter to true. Now, this type of event work here, where we press down on something and then maybe we apply a mouse move event or even another press up event, uh, and then we remove the press up event as soon as, or we remove the, the mouse move once we press up, that kind of thing, that, that event structure, we've been doing that in interactive media since the mid 90s. I've been doing this for 25 years, we're still doing it. So it's kind of funny how sometimes people say technology changes, and yet in code, the principles that we've been using using here in Zim have been around since making CD-ROMs in Director. I know I was there winning Canadian New Media Awards at the time. Then we moved it into Flash, and now we've moved it here onto the canvas. So these things are needed. They come up over and over again, and the systems that we use, this is, this is what it's like. Now, we've done a lot of automation, but there's, um, there's some things that just, you know, uh, is actual programming, and so we still need to do them. Okay, what is in that make person? Hopefully you're you're happy here in this Zim Explorer. Ooh, yeah, is it fun exploring this stuff? We got got a ways to go, but we'll we'll get there. You don't have to do it all at once as well. You're welcome to listen to a bit and then come back later. That would be fine as well. Okay, enough of that then. Let's carry on. So there's our function make person where we're receiving the column and the row. So what we're doing is we're finding out, well, what is the item? at that column and row. 
and the board, uh, this confuses things a little bit here, the board can accept more than one item on its uh, on a tile. So you could have several things, or you know, as many as you want, really, on the tile, which means that any tile, when you get the item that's there, you actually have to get items, which is will return an array. And then we know we're only putting one thing in there, so we're asking for the first thing in the array. So this is going to be the first thing in the array. If there isn't anything in the array, because nothing's on the, on the tile at the, at the column row there, then it's going to return undefined and the item will be undefined. But if there is an item there, then we're going to remove the item. Uh, else, if there's no item there, then we're going to add something there. So we're going to add a new person. The person actually comes along with the with the uh, board, uh, or sorry, with the game module, and it's sort of built to go on to our board here. There's also a tree, so we can make a new tree, and there's a new orb. <laughs> we might make a new trap one day. Uh, that would be kind of fun, some sort of, you know, bad thing. But the orb is a collectible in a sense. The tree is sort of an environment. The person is the player or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and then maybe we should make a trap or, or something like that, a spike. No, we don't want a spike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what a trap would look like. We'll have to ask Daphne. Daphne will tell us. Oh no, she doesn't know what traps look like either. <laughs> it's like she'd be the worst one to ask. <laughs> she, knows, she knows what the bottom of a trap door looks like. Uh, anyway, so there we are adding a new person, scaling it a little bit, and we added it the call and row that uh, where we are. Great, so that's not too bad, huh? We want to make a person. If there's one there, remove it. But if there isn't, then then we add it. And um, then we're adjusting the element score. So the elements is a scorer, a scorer uh, class. In it's part of the game module as well. There's also a timer class. The scorer class comes with a score property that you can adjust for a score. We're not exactly keeping score, although it is the game of life, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, this one's just telling us how many elements we have on the board at any time. And in, in board, these things are called pieces. So uh, board.pieces will give us a reference to the Zim container that actually holds any person or tree that we put there. So we ask for the num children. Now that's not the length. This isn't an array. This is a Zim container. So in interactive media, we often have containers and we ask for the num children. We, we treat the things inside as children. So there's no need to really build an extra array there uh, and use the length or anything like that. And that's sometimes when people are coming in from programming and they're used to using arrays, they tend to want to put everything they make into an array. Well, we don't have to do that here. Uh, the container is very much like an array, so often you'll find that you don't need arrays anymore. We can easily loop through containers. We can find out the child at I, you know, that type of stuff. So anyway, this is one way we can find out how many people are on the board. We could have also used the board data, which is, uh, which is an array. But uh, this is fine. Okay, and we update the stage when we add a person. Great, because we don't want to update the stage after we press up, because that would, you know, we wouldn't see the people being added as we drag. So each time we add a person, we're updating the stage. The top interface. Take a breather. <sighs> So what we just went through, by the way, is maybe uh, we should refresh there. We went through the process of dragging and adding these people right there. And if we wanted to, a little bit later, if we say we want trees here and we hit play, we're going to see that trees get added. Oh, that didn't last very long, did it? Um, we are going to see the trees get added. If we wanted to, we could have added trees as we dragged here as well could have used the same sort of logic. Uh, we're, we're not adding trees all the time, just uh, sometimes adding trees. And we're going to see that soon. So there's, there's our trees being added as we go. We just decided not to add trees uh, when we were initially drawing. All right, so for our top interface, we have the game of life up there, and we're positioning this. Positioning is a pose here has become really, really handy. What we're saying here is, or what we often would say here, is position zero from the center, so that means perfectly centered, and uh, 30 from 
the, the top. So by default, this is top here. So we could put that in, but that's the default. And why did we say minus 10? Well, let's have a look at this. Open in browser. We're going to have a look at this if we, if we kept that centered. Here it is, and you can see that the, um, the of isn't quite centered on that tip. So we just brought it back a little bit um, to minus 10. And let me just uh, scroll on down. We had a, a glitch that hasn't been fixed here on this one. This would be 3,000. So let me start this off properly. OK, so that's why we adjusted that. Uh, where was that adjustment? Uh, bottom interface, not yet. Top interface, right. So we went minus 10 there. So this means minus 10 from the center. Great. And we positioned it. For these ones, these are the, the scores uh, at the left and at the right. And there we are uh, supplying left and right. That will turn them isometric. Otherwise, these would just be rectangular boxes. And we are locating those at a certain location. The skewing of them sort of makes it a bit difficult to locate. So what we did to locate is we went dot place. So if we add dot place here, we've mentioned this in the com comments as well, used dot place. This is the elements one, so let's now place the elements. I refresh here, and I F12 uh, to see our console. So there's the console, and the console is saying place the object to get the new position. So we can pick this thing up now and place it. So if we want it there, it's telling us here's the loc, and we copy this, copy and we paste it right in where the loc is, like so. Now we would delete the place and uh, run it again here, refresh. And there it is placed there, if we so desire. Actually, kind of like it there. Maybe we should have placed this one on the edge, too. Anyway, whatever. We'll undo that and get rid of the place. So once you're finished with the place, then you can just delete it. We've also put them on the bottom because note that these things are made after the board. So here's the board up here, right there. So we've centered the board. Um, because these are made after the board, that means they're on top. And any of the trees, they're tall enough to overlap the, the things at the side, the elements and the, the generation text boxes. So we want the trees to come up on top of that instead of behind. It, it's up to you, but anyway, this is one way that we can place these on the bottom. We could have also located on the stage or null and then said zero. That would be another way that we can put something on the bottom. So the parameter after the container is usually the index that we want to add that at. All right, but rather than, I mean, and it'll default to the stage, so we could say null there, but that looks a little bit unruly. And we have the nice little chainable method dot bot that really tells us what's going on there. It's a, a bit easier to read, I think. More fun to use. Who doesn't want to use a dot bot? <laughs> now we've embedded the label right in that. And I don't usually do that, but why not? Especially when it's isometric. Otherwise, we'd have to sort of figure out how to make the label isometric as well. So we may as well embed that. Note we put it, we positioned it at zero. So that's centered. A minus 30. And uh, so zero centered and minus 30 from the top of elements right there. So here's here's elements is the score. And that gives us this word elements right here nicely aligned with it. Now when we did that, the centering looks off. Just It's just a perspective issue. So we could have moved it if we wanted to, but what we decided to do, I guess, was just add some spaces in there. Mind you, it might, might have been easier to just move that. You know what I mean? Let me show you what, what that looks like if we don't put any uh, movement on there. And we refresh here. Um, it just looks like it's too far to the right and so too far in uh, on both cases. It probably is centered, but just perspectively, <laughs> it looks awkward. So if we wanted to, we could have moved these over this way, but at the time we just threw some spaces in there. So whatever. This will be it. All right. So the main game of life logic. So let's take a look. Now, we've got a little message saying here that all we did initially was make a board. Do you remember making the board? It wasn't very hard at all. So there's making the board. We had this code in here, and then we had the logic. So on the board, we hard-coded some player positions. 
uh, we're way down at the bottom, we're doing this uh, as we begin as well. We didn't even make person. We, we just said, hey, uh, board.add this new person at this row and column, and it was roughly uh, like this. We would add a few, few things, and that was our starting point. We've actually done that to start us off as well. Uh, CodePen likes it when they, they see some animations at the start. People like seeing something happen. They don't just want to see the static board where you can then go ahead and add your stuff. They want to see a little animation in the preview. So we made sure to run, run the app at the start, and we'll take a look at that right at the very end of our Explore. But anyway, all we had was, was that, the board, and then we had the, the information here, so uh, or sort of the, the logic. And uh, what it looks like, roughly the logic is, is here, right there. So doot, 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 doot. there it is with that part. Oh, we also had to find out um, what things were around the object. So we had to add that. In other words, those 20 or 30 lines of code would make the game of life work. All the rest of the code in here is adding the interface to control it and stuff like that. But it's certainly good to explore that interface as well. Uh, it's just to let you know that we could have made a game of life in about 30 lines of code, and it would have still looked just as great, but there would have been no way to control it. Uh, the, the initial players would be on the board already. Uh, there would have been no way to add ones, uh, no way to pause it, no way to choose trees or not, or restart, or any, all these kinds of things. All right, so anyway, let's carry on. So what we've done is we've made a play game function, and this gets called by an interval. So as soon as we hit the play button, an interval will run. And the Zim interval will pass in an interval object that holds information like what count we're on. So that's handy because as that interval keeps going and making generations, we can just set the generation score, which is really, uh, you know, that text field on the right hand side to whatever the interval is at. We're also using a count to animate animate the addition of these things. So let me show you what we mean by that. So come on back here. Let's uh, increase the speed here so that this is really slow. We'll make these things here and I'm going to hit play. So do you see how they sort of go in steps? Um, and then they're gone. Uh, what we're doing is we're making an interval, or sorry, the, the, the interval is the generation, but within the interval, it has to calculate what's going to live and die for every single square. So what we've done is added times out. We've looped through all of the squares, and each time we loop, we add a timeout. This timeout would be zero. This timeout would be whatever the total time is divided by the number of squares. And this one's whatever the total is divided by the number of squares times 2, times 3, times 4, times 5, times 6, all the way up to this one, which would basically weight the, the total number or the total time. Okay, do you see what I mean? So these ones will go first, second, third, fourth, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and finally these ones will go. And that kind of animates the process within each generation. Now, we didn't have to do that. Initially, we didn't do that. And what happens is just everything changes all at the same time. It's kind of neat to see it that way, too. It just goes whoop, 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 and everything changes. But uh, I kind of like the cascading effect where it sort of animates through the changes. All right, so the way we handled that is coming up here. Here we are, uh, we've got a count that is going to help manage that. It's uh, just our own local variable. Uh, we're looping through the board's data. Now, board data is the information for only the stuff that's on the board. Board.info would be the, the information for everything, even if it's not on the board. So we've chosen the data. In this case, because we don't have any information off of the board, uh, we could have used board.info here. But uh, really what we want is to operate only on the board. Mind you, if, if we had this game of life that was bigger than the board, for so like uh, say it was twice as big 
as the board. We could use little arrows. Arrows get, get put on the board and we could arrow across this all this world and we could see the game of life across everything. At which point we would have wanted info here because then it would have processed the whole world, not just what was showing on the board. All right, well, that has nothing really to do with the game of life. That's more if you want to use the isometric board from the game module, there's a tip for you. You can make a world that is bigger than what you see and then use arrows to move about um, the world, like a dungeon or something like that. These often are called tile maps, etc. You might have a big map that is uh, bigger than the board, but then you're viewing only a part of that map on the board. Sound good? All right. Along with uh, that, by the way, if we're just talking about the Zim board, there's also pathfinding. So we can bring in this library called Easy Star, which does A star pathfinding. And um, we've got examples of that. There's a maze on CodePen. You can see how that goes. There's also zimjs.com slash ISO for isometric. We'll show you the basics of using pathfinding as well. It's a cool demonstration. All right, so we're looping through the data. Um, the, the data is in rows and columns. So there's uh, an array of rows. And then we're going to get that array of rows right here. And then we're going to loop through the rows to get our individual columns. So uh, there you go. And each time we've got J's and I's there. So calls will be, I guess maybe uh, it's probably not plural, but um, perhaps that would just be a call. You would get there, that's our data for the column. So the item will either be undefined or an object, right? Okay, so here we are going to get the item at the, the I and the J. So we go get items, remember, because there might be multiple items at that location, and at zero. And so there could be multiple items on a tile. We get the item. Now, it actually, at, at this point, um, we, we need to get the information up from the tiles around this item. And we're now getting into, will this thing, if it's alive, will it die? Will it stay there? And if it's not alive, if, it's, if there's nothing there, will something grow there? So in either case, regardless of whether there's an item there, we still need to get tiles around this board. And what that does is it gets the eight tiles around the current tile that are around the I and the J that we're on. Great, then we're going to loop through that array of eight things. Each time we're going to receive the tile and we're saying, hey, if the tile exists, because that's, that's a tricky one too, uh, if we're on the edge, let's take a look at our board here. If we happen to be right here and we're looping around the various uh, tiles here, it starts from the top corner, it goes, it goes the top corner, which is zero, zero, then here, then to here, and there's nothing there, there's nothing here, there's nothing here, and back to here, there's something there, something there, something there, and then we're done. So we're trying to find out how many things are around there. Well, we won't even get a tile if it's, if it's off the board. So we're saying if there is a tile, and we go to get the items there, and the length of that is greater than zero, we have to watch that, we can't just ask, does it have a get item at that tile? or get items at that tile, because that will return an empty array if there's nothing there. Well, that, that would count as true. Hey, an empty array is still something, right? So we're asking for the length. Is the length bigger than zero? And if that's the case, then we're increasing the number of items. So this is trying to count how many items are around the current square. Right. Is, it's not even trying, it is. So now down below, we're going to uh, process this. Now, once again, we could have just commented this part out here and gone down to the end, end of the timeout, and then they would process all at the same time. Um, but uh, anyway, well, let's describe what was going on there. So we'll undo these. So we're increasing our count each time. This is a count for each tile that is examined. Every tile is examined on the board. And then we set the timeout to be the total speed. So this is coming from a speed slider down below. There's a slider. 
that holds the current value of the speed between 50 milliseconds and 2,000 milliseconds. So we divide that by the number of tiles that are on the board, and that gets us a time per tile, and we multiply it by whatever count we're at. And so that will animate that through. It could be a little bit uh, out of sync, you know what I mean? Where some at the beginning will go initially quite quick at the beginning, but then they're going to wait, and the ones at the end will, will come in closer to the end, but so be it. That's the way that we decided to do. So in other words, it's not really an even amount of time per change. It's an even amount of time per square. All right, so that's our timeout, and we're running this function. Uh, the problem with adding timeouts is if all of a sudden we decided to pause the game, those timeouts would still be running. So rather than uh, clearing or pausing all of the timeouts, there's many timeouts. We just um, put in a little thing saying, "Hey, don't bother doing, don't bother coming, or, or leave, leave this uh, if the play button is um, not in the right setting, or indeed if um, uh, we've paused to check, like we, we or sorry, we've checked the the uh, the pause checkbox, right? So on here, if we paused it, we don't want any of those timeouts to be making things because we paused. And if we uh, are in the play mode here, or where it says play, when we're making things, we don't want things to be added as, as we're making things. All right, that kind of stuff came in later. Usually we don't think of that until you know we're already running it. So we would come back in and add that in there. So now here's the actual logic. So once again, all we really needed was, hey, we we just needed the board and our and our logic. Uh, put throw, throw that in an interval, and, and it would have been okay. Here's the, here's the logic. If there is an item, remember we asked if there's an item right here. Item is equal to board dot get items at zero. So that might be something, or it might be nothing. If there is an item, that means something's alive there. And if the number of items that we calculated here, so this is the num items around the board. So if that num items is less than two, there's not enough. Or if it's greater than three, then there's too many. So it's sort of specific, isn't it? You could probably adjust that, make it if it's greater than four, or maybe if it's less than one, and you, you can sort of play with the, the, the terms. But I, I would imagine those were worked out to uh, cause the sort of the maximum amount of, of life, or, well, maybe not the maximum amount of life, but sort of like the a balance between the two. Anyway, if, um, if that's bad, if there's too few or too many, we remove the item from the board. We also update the element score at that time based on the board pieces and we stage dot update to show that those have been taken away or that that item has been taken away else if there's nobody on that square or no tree or no person if it's not alive then if the number of items around the square is three then we create something Woohoo! so this would have been pretty simple we would have just said board dot add a new person if we wanted just a new person, probably scale it. So we would have taken that right there and put it right in there and not had all this complicated looking stuff. That would have been fine. That would have added a new person each time at our position I and J. We would have then updated that there's a person there and updated the stage. Uh, but what we've done is we've added some odds. So if the trees checkbox is checked, Right, we're going to make the new item. This is a ternary operator. So here's the conditional. Here's what we do if it if it's true, this thing, and here's what we do after the colon if it's false. So if the trees aren't checked, we're just adding a new person as mentioned. But if the trees are checked, then we're rolling a random number, and here we've got another ternary operator in here, three parts. That's what ternary means. So if random is uh, greater than 0.1, so that's 90% of the time, we'll do what's after this question mark. We will provide a new person. 10% of the time, we'll provide a new tree. So there's the ternary. Usually our ternaries are on one line like this. I, since it had a nested ternary, and we don't have to, but I decided I'd separate them on multiple lines to help us out a bit, and we mentioned that in the comment. How's this going for you?
<laughs> I mean, I never know. You're welcome to leave a comment or give us a thumbs up if you're enjoying this. If you're enjoying this right now, just go like look on down there and hit a little thumb up for us. It makes us feel feel better when we when we see some uh, some feedback. Uh, thank you. So there we are, putting our comments on the ends of those brackets. Sometimes that helps. There we're ending the timeout. Here we're ending the various loops. So now we're outside of the loop, but we're still inside the end, oh, end play game. So we're still inside the play game function. So once we've looped through and we've added and removed pieces, we then ask, hey, what's the number of children in the pieces? And if it's equal to zero, then we're done and we stop the, we clear the interval. Uh, initially, we cleared the interval and we went right back to the beginning. We cleared the board as well and we went back to the beginning. Um, but then we found that um, you might want to see how many generations that went. So we might want to leave the generations in there so you can see. Um, also, there's a message here saying, could try and test for repeat patterns. We didn't do that. So if you have a square of four things, they're just going to keep on repeating and uh, the generations go on and on and on. We probably could have done a test for that. It might have been a bit tricky. You'd have to match uh, the, the current pattern, the next generation. You have to find out if things are in the same place as that. Loop through that and say, is there one here or not? And if there's ever a difference, then uh, return false from the loop and uh, loops by default will return true. So in the end, you would just ask were the results of this loop true or false? If, it's, uh, if it was true, then you might say, yikes, it's the same or, or whichever way you want to go. So there could be some logic that would check for that. We didn't. So there you go. That's the, the crux of it. This was the logic area. All of this stuff to, to play that game and where to go? There's oh no, we missed it. That's the make person. We went past the top. Here it is, right here. You can, by the way, collapse that, and that allows you to jump right into the next part, which is the bottom interface. So yeah, that's what those little arrows are for. So here's the bottom interface. These are the component, or these components will be added to the tile and placed at the bottom. It's optional, but generally we found that that's uh, the easiest way. So all these things, rather than manually trying to place this, manually trying to place this one, what we've done is added a uh, added each of these to a tile. We can then use the spacing H to space this. And in this case, we didn't. When we used the spacing H, we had equal spacings, and we found that the spacing between these two guys were uh, just too much. So we have an option at that point. <clears throat> We can create the thing and then afterwards we can move the elements or instead of using the spacing we could provide call sizes and so that's what we did. We've, we've provided a series of call sizes to get the spacing on this just how we wanted. Um, in the final one we're putting a logo here that's why it may seem a touch off. There's the little icon there for, for Zim. All right well let's see how we created these. Uh, this now is uh, not exactly related to the, the game of life, per se, or, or even the isometric board, although perhaps a little bit uh, of board control will go on here. But this is a uh, traditional Zim component building uh, along those lines. There are ways, or you can use a DAT GUI to put up here. You could have used DAT GUI a lot of the... Uh, for instance, processing, visualizations, have a little pull down here where they can do things like this, set sliders and, and check boxes. We have that too. We made, uh, we showed how that can be done with the Zim list and the Zim list can go on a pull down mode. And we've actually got list elements that are very much like the DAT GUI elements to allow you to pick colors or check boxes or sliders with data on them. So we recreated that in Zim and provided interface into that, into the Zim list. There's an example up on CodePen and various other places. Look at for it in bubbling called probably the pull down. Uh, but we prefer to have our interface showing, like just embedded in here. It's got a lot of color. It's easy to use on mobile, nice and ready for mobile. And I think people like to see these types of things. Certainly we do in Zim. So our interfaces usually are more, are more part of the presentation rather than uh, hidden up in some uh, HTML component area. All right.
So on we go with our components. Let's have a look. So we're making a new slider, setting a min and max, and a bar length, and a current value. This is new to Zim 10.8 or 7 or something like that, where we can specify the current value of the slider to start. Same with the dial and a few other things as well. Before, we would have to drop out of chaining. This is chaining here on the end. We'd have to drop out of chaining to manually set a property for that slider to same. But anyway, now we have a current value. It's nice. We're throwing a label, and once again, we did the same trick where we actually throw the label right onto the slider, into the slider container, and that allows it to be positioned along with the, along with the uh, slider itself. So when we put the slider into the, the tile, along comes this word that says speed right here. Okay, then we, we uh, remember that we mentioned there are a couple buttons and a couple checkboxes, and these buttons have similarities. Their corners, their roll colors are the same, their size is the same, and uh, same with this. They might have their alpha. <clears throat> alpha is the same, size is the same. So when that happens, rather than position things like the background color and the roll background color and corner and scale on each component, we've now brought this up into Zim style. So much like the reasons you would use CSS, as a matter of fact, similar, similar format to CSS, but using the object literals here, uh, which have been around in coding for a long time, well before CSS came along. So there it is, style, and in Zim, if we want to put specific styles on buttons or on, or on any uh, type of uh, display object, then we would put them into the type here. We've also got group, so we could say comma, uh, not key up at all, comma, uh, group, colon, and then in the group, we could have certain names like the highlights or something like that. Uh, this would be uh, the styles for that. That would uh, operate like a CSS class. We can also, if we want, not put any style, say all of our corners. We could say corner, colon uh, 10. So that would make, or maybe 20, I guess would be better. This would set the default corner for all of the corners. Let's say 40 like that. And then we can comment this one out like so. Nice. Okay, so this means all corners would be 40 or anywhere corners could be available. We refresh here. Um, now, oh, yikes, did you see what happened there? <laughs> the corners on the people, anything after that, anything that gets made after we've specified that, so here's our corners on the, on the check boxes, and look, there's our corners on the buttons. So, um, Anyway, that's actually quite interesting for the people, though, isn't it? I wonder what the trees look like. Let's see if we can play it. Yeah, there's the, the bottoms of the trees are also uh, <laughs> strangely rooted. It's like the Jetsons or something like that. Uh, now, we could avoid that. The way we would avoid that is we say, say we wanted the general corners only for this stuff right here. Uh, those are the buttons. Um, to where? To the... Or those are the checkboxes. Anyway, at, at this point, we would say style is equal to, we just clear the style like so, or you could set it to null. And then when we refresh here, those general corners would be, uh, they're not put on the people anymore. They're only here on, it uh, looks like we messed up a size there or something like that, but they're only here uh, like so. All oh, right, because we turned the style off before we got to the checkboxes. So those checkboxes were the default uh, sizes. Checkboxes are quite big, as you can see there. They're now overlapping one another. That's a problem. They're so big. Check Both checkboxes and steppers are large because this is made primarily for mobile mobile first you can easily scale these checkboxes down but on mobile you want them uh, nice and big so our checkboxes and stuff are big we probably well anyway uh that's a little bit of a tip into style we don't want to spend too much time on that we probably want to finish off the finish this off huh so we don't want to make all corners 40 we do want to make them 10 on the buttons. And note we're using a series there to change the background. The very first button that gets made will have a background color of yellow, and the next one will have a background color of green. Cool, huh? 
All right, let's call it, come on down. There we are making the button. When we tap on the button, this is the new game button, uh, but it says new on it like that. We usually call our buttons the same as the label, but we can't actually call uh, a constant called new because that would interfere with the new keyword. So uh, we had to call it new button. Oh well. We're toggling the play button. Let's go down and just take a peek at the play button. The play button toggles between play and replay. So if we happen to be playing, then the button's actually going to say replay on it so that we can click replay and turn it back to um, the default or, or re replay thing. So if we're, we happen to be playing, we want to make sure that the button, and, and we hit the new key, we want to turn that off. So visually here, if uh, let's refresh this. Um, what happened? New game. Oh, what was that button called then? New game is not... What was? Where was the new game issue? Uh, 293. 293. New game. Was that the name of this button? I think I called it a new button. Must have been new game. That was the play. New game. There we go. Sorry about that. And refresh here. Uh, right, that's going. So what were we looking at? Do you remember? Oh yeah, so if we do this and then we play uh, and we hit new, we want to toggle that. It used to say replay. We want to toggle this back again. And you can't just make the text say play because the button is storing a toggle. Uh, effect. Okay, so uh, we don't want to just change the text of the button. We actually want to toggle it back to false. That's one way of doing it. That returns the play button to its initial state. Again, this would be something we didn't plan on right away. We realized, oh yeah, we got to set that back. So we build the button and come back and adjust for that. So if there's a play interval, then we clear the play interval. We got to watch for that. If we haven't actually played, and there is no play interval. If you try and clear something that has, that's undefined or null, or there's nothing in it yet, you're going to get a red error. So uh, we did that, we got a red error, and we said, oh, okay, if there is a play interval, then we can clear it. So just to throw that in there after. We're also, if we're making something new, we're going to clear the items on the board. So that's a method that, of board that will just clear the items, reset our, our scores back to zero. We also are dealing with the visibles. We aren't letting people change the speed as we're playing. That can actually lead to uh, problems in uh, consistency of, uh, of what happens. And so if you change something while all those, all those uh, timeouts are going, you might mess things up. So we just said, ah, the easiest way is to stop them from changing the speed as, as, it's anim you know, as the generations are going by. Also, if you set the trees to all of a sudden the no trees, you know, hey, I don't want any trees, it, it stops making new trees, but the trees that are already made, we'd have to loop through all of the board pieces, and if they're a tree, turn them into a person. So we didn't bother doing that. It, it could have been done, but the easiest way was to balance the, set, the turning off of the, the speed slider with the turning off of the trees thing. So when we play, boop, these two things disappear. It kind of balances a little bit. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Alrighty, and we're also making sure that if we've hit the new button that we're, we're not paused anymore. There's no need for the pause thing to be, so the pause check is false. We're updating the stage so all of that stuff goes in place. That's what's happening when we hit the new button. When we hit the play button, here's, here's where it's all happening. Uh, where we're going to start the interval. So we come on in, the play button has a toggle, so it's going between play and replay. We found that if we played, we used to just sort of say, okay, uh, once it's done, uh, the play goes back to, well, it keeps on play, but as we're playing, we were going to be, it would be something like uh, a restart or like a, a new, you know, maybe it was a new or something like that. And what we found is we might want to play the same one we just played because we found, oh, there's cool patterns in here. I want to show you that one. We want to be able to sort of um, replay it. And that means we need to remember before we hit the play button or as we hit the play button, before we, we actually start our interval here, we want to record what elements are on the screen. So that as those, all those elements change, when we hit the replay, 
we'll be able to rebuild those same elements. So that sounds like quite the task. Let's, let's hit new and I'll show you what I mean. See that squiggle that goes like around like that? Have a look at that. We hit play now. Off they go doing their thing. And if we hit replay, there they are again. Isn't that magical? And wow, is that hard to do? How do we do that? Uh, there's nothing in the board class that gives us that directly but uh, we have to use programming to do that. So we make our own array called last elements and we we declare that out here. We make our own array called last elements and as we hit the play before we actually start the interval we're going to get all the items on the board so that is available on the board thing that that gives you access to all of the items. For each item we're going to push into the last elements the items board call and the items board row. So this tells us where those things are. And we're storing a little object that keeps track of the call and the row for each item that exists. Now we can't just throw the item in there because the item itself may end up being deleted or removed. And in the end, if we go to reset it, that item's not there anymore. Ah, or it's in a different place. Ah. So here we're just storing the uh, column and the row information for the item. If we wanted to, we could also store what type of item it is, a tree or a person. And we could, although we didn't start with trees, uh, we could even probably store the colors of the person. Anyway, but anyway, uh, we didn't really need to. We're just going to restart with um, with people in the right place. You know, I didn't really care what the person looks like. Okay, so that gives us the information we need uh, to use later. And as a matter of fact, here it is. Uh, stopping, stop and play. Stop and play. So remember, we've got a toggle. If the play is toggled, that means we want to start playing. Else, that means we're doing the, the replay, and here we are. Take a look. We stop the interval from going. I'm going to show you the interval in just a sec. We clear all the items on the board, and if we're remaking here, which we are, we're going to loop through the last elements, and each time we get the item, and we're going to make a person at the item's call and row properties. Nice, huh? Well, that's all. That wasn't that bad. We, we reset the length, and we make sure that uh, what, however long last elements were, that's what our score length is. Or we could have asked for the board num children on the on the items. And then we're bringing back uh, visibility on those things that we took away, the speed and the trees. All right, so uh, we're just about there. Here is our play interval. The play interval is saying whatever the speed is, uh, the slider speed is, that's uh, set the interval to that. And go ahead and play the game start right away. So that last true there means start right away. This one means how many times do you want to go, but we'll go forever. All right, so we did for a little while made the slider, we, we can make this dynamic by passing in a function here. So if we pass in an arrow function, uh, this is magical, isn't it? This is a function and we're passing that function into the interval and zimv, which uh, reads dynamic parameters, one of those par parameter types is a function that returns a value. This is the arrow function returning the speed's value. So basically, this interval, every time the interval goes, it would check the current uh, speed, which means we could dynamically change the speed of this interval just like that using a slider. So that's pretty cool. However, we found when we let the people dynamically change the speed of the simulation of the game of life, like I said, some of the leftover timeouts would uh, inter interfere and conflict. Probably could have solved that by clearing all those timeouts or not using the timeouts, um, but uh, we just decided, hey, rather than making it dynamic, you can only use the slider at the beginning of running the simulation. Uh, but that's how you could have set a dynamic parameter in there, which is very, very cool. Okay, so imagine with a slider, you could adjust the speed of something falling from the sky. You know, how hard is the game based on the slider? Uh, it's neat, so dynamically change that speed quite easily. So after that, we set, uh, remember this is us playing the game. At this point, we set the speed and the trees visible to false. Great, that's the main button. And these guys are pretty easy. This is just a quick checkbox right here. 
uh, with the label of pause. Uh, that's for the game. And when we pause, we're calling this change. So the, the checkbox will issue or dispatch a change event. And that's what the chainable change uh, picks up. Or we could have used a, a pause dot on change, a normal on method there. We would have had to drop out of, of chaining though. So at that point you don't chain an on on there. You'd have to lock or close that and you would go uh, pause dot on round brackets quote oops quote change like that. Call this function. All right. So we'd have to drop out of the chaining and call the chain thing in an on method. But Zim, a little while back, uh, version 10, I think, or somewhere around there, we introduced the dot change. And that uh, is just a chainable way of doing the same thing. So if there is a play interval, we're going to pause the interval to whatever pause is checked or not. So this is nice and easy, isn't it? Call pause on the play interval based on whether this pause checkbox is checked. Tree isn't doing anything, that just gets read. Uh, when we decide what to, to make, either a new person or a tree, uh, if this is uh, at that point, we say, hey, if it's checked, we, we can maybe do trees, but if it's not checked, we'll just make persons. So we have no event on trees. And then here's the tile, last thing. Woohoo, trying to get in on one minute, uh, or one minute, one hour. <laughs> one hour, oh my goodness, we're over an hour. Ay, ay, ay. You guys are troopers. If you're still here, you should definitely come visit us at zimjs.com slash slack and say, I lasted the whole hour. You know, I would love to hear from you. We would all love to hear from you. So come on in. Uh, we're fun and friendly. Are we fun? Hard to say. Is it fun still being here? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. All right. So the last uh, step here was to tile the, uh, the op tile usually tiles just an object. Uh, and, and clones it as it goes. So, hey, tile uh, 100 circles. Brrr, there, there you go, with certain calls and rows. Uh, but with the ZimV values in there, we can tile a series. So once again, this is a ZimV dynamic parameter that we're putting in here. And if we use a series, it will tile the speed, which is the slider, the new game button, the play button, the pause checkbox, and the trees checkbox in that order. And if we had more than one, two, three, four, five things, if, if we said five columns and three rows, we would get three rows of these things. Um, and that's great if you, if you want that. But one thing that the cloning, that's called cloning, one thing that the cloning does is when you clone, you, you do not clone the events. So the various uh, tap events and chain, or click events and changes, uh, wouldn't come along with it. So what we've done is we've made sure that we're only only tiling the the number that we have. Calls five rows will be one by default. So we're only tiling the same number of things that we have there, and we've turned clone false. That will uh, make sure that the events that are on these things stay on those things because we're not cloning. Okay. We're also setting the call size, as we mentioned, specific call sizes to space that as properly, and we're doing that in a series. So that allows us to tile something and easily specify the column sizes in a series like that. Isn't that nice? So the Zim V value is just showing up everywhere. It's in styles, it's in tiling, it's in uh, the uh, interval showing up everywhere. Very, very handy, very, very powerful in, in Zim to be able to handle that. We could have made these random. If we put in an array like this, boop, boop, then it would uh, set the call size to be random of those things. Now, of course, we would, wouldn't want that to happen. Let's see what that does. Now, we have to wait for them to come in here. There they are randomly it's picking from those things and it uh, looks a bit like a mess, doesn't it? But you never know, that, that could come in hand, handy for some other thing like that. We could also pass in a function, which would dynamically, based on the results of a function, do that. We can also pass in a min and a max, where it would choose uh, randomly between a min and a, and a maximum number there. Those are the types of things that we can uh, pass in. Or, indeed, just a single number would be fine too. 
just pass right on through that Zim V. All right, I think we've been here long enough, but have a look. That's how easy it is to position it. We're saying zero in the center and 30 up from the bottom. And when we say 30 up from the bottom, let's save that, refresh here. 30 up from the bottom means, uh, we gotta wait again. That's that animation intro. 30 up from the bottom means the bottom edge of this thing is 30 pixels up. Okay, so it's always to the edge of that. If we said 30 pixels from the top, it would be the top of these things. It would be 30 pixels down from the top. All right, well, I hear my cat knocking at the door. This stuff was the demo version. We're making a bunch of people. We're turning off certain things in the interface. We're running manually. We're running the interval there. And once that interval is finished, we then bring back in the interface. So uh, after 3000, we're bringing back in the interface. The end, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that nice? Uh, you know, here we are, and this has been... Whoa! A Zim Explorer for all explorers and making the game of life for CodePen. Come on in to ZimJS.com and ZimJS.com slash Slack. Also, we do have a CodePen uh, topic page at CodePen.io slash topic slash Zim. And that's exciting to be there. Please uh, give us some thumbs up if you're on CodePen. Follow us and same with uh, these videos. Uh, cheers, good night, and good day.